I never loved my stepbrother, and you know what? Truthfully, I can't even say I liked the little bastard. <sighs> but by no means they deserved the fate he was given, and you know, whatever it may have been, it was just, it just wasn't his time, and he was getting better, and let me start off from the beginning. I'm putting my memories on the paper now, as best as I can recall them, before pills, therapy, and whatever fucked up shit they can think of takes them away forever. We became a family when I was only six years of age. My mother died when I was barely out of infancy, and my father, in loneliness and grief, turned towards the same woman who showed him an inkling of interest. Or, at the very least, tolerance. After a long, tremendous romance, they tied their vows and almost immediately began making each other's lives miserable, a theme which resonated between me and my new brother. Daniel wasn't, well, a literal monster, but in the eyes of a younger sibling, he very well could have been. Two years my senior, I grew up dreading the inevitability of teasing or beating, or knowing the goddamn hopelessness that he would try to make every day I was on this planet miserable. One instance that sticks out on my mind in peculiar now is perhaps resurfaced by the irony of events that caused my incarceration. Either way, we grew up in a small country town, and our backyard consisted of a massive forest which stretched as far as a child could wander. I spent many hours in this wood, and where most children might feel lost or flat out scared in the wilds, <laughs> I felt safe and secure from the conflicts that ravaged my home away from Daniel and away from that evil fucking woman he called a mother. Not too far into the woods, just up a hill through some thick bramble was a pond of decent size, old and stagnant and covered in green film of algae. While most of the forest was a comfort, the pond always bothered me. I hated everything about it, from its sticky green appearance to the faintly putrid stench that that water still produced. But it was wide enough to cover a large stretch of the forest, and it was necessary to pass during my hikes. One day, while I was unaware, my stepbrother decided to follow me. He stalked me through the forest as I explored, just out of sight like a little fucking predator on the hunt. As I paused by the pond to gather stones, Daniel silently closed the gap between us, creeping between trees as he approached. I never had a chance. I never heard him coming. The next thing I knew, I was pushed through the air and tumbled down the water, crashing through the layer of algae into the dark cold of the pond. At that moment, I, I started panicking, struggling for air, desperate to escape the murky water that I was absolutely positive in my young mind would leave nothing to be found just swallowing me up. As I fought to breach the surface, I found that I was being held down, forced to hold the last bit of air that burst, that just burned to escape my lungs. Every terrible fear I knew felt like a reality waiting for me at the bottom of that pond. Finally. When I was all but sure I would fucking die, I found myself released, and I broke to the surface with a gasp. Every muscle in my body was screaming for air and the comfort of shore. When I reached safety and had come to my sentence, I became aware of the uproarious laughter coming from behind me. I turned to Saul, but I should have freaking expected my stepbrother crackling like a madman at his brilliant ambush. Of course, when I arrived home, his mother would hear nothing of my side of the story. Daniel told her I fell in, and his best clothes were ruined, trying to save me from drowning. The thrashing she gave me for my lies was one of the worst I had ever received. And, to make it all f to make it all worst, she told me I could not go back to the comfort of the forest ever again. As I said, I never loved a little bastard, but there was one time, and perhaps the only time, I honestly felt close to him. But <laughs> that only took the death of his horrid mother. It happened when we were, say, 17 and 19 retrospectively, while she was walking home from a liquor store trip at late at night. A drunk driver swerved just a few inches off the road and struck her in the side. When she fell, she landed in a guardrail, killing her instantly. Our family's full of little ironies. In his grief, Daniel turned to God. I myself was a devout agnostic, finding no fault in faith, but mainly in religion. 
At the time, I supported his newfound devotion, believing that it might be a positive influence on life. After all, I couldn't think of any religion that would have condoned his prior behavior. Or, at the very least, perhaps I would earn some well-deserved apologies for a childhood of mistreatment. He found a church near home, one that I haven't exactly ever heard of. The call, it's called um, the Church of Shepherd and Prior Day Saints. And he spent most of his spare time engaged in study, as he had recently moved away into a nearby apartment complex. In fact, I actually rarely saw him anymore. And you know what? I was happy to no longer suffer its presence. I focused on my schoolwork and looked after my father, who had once again fallen into a depression and drink after losing his second wife. But to be honest, I, I guess I can't really blame him for that. My stepbrother came by every few weeks to see how we were doing, and I quickly noticed a great improvement in his character. As I had hoped, he expressed deep remorse for his childish behavior and often sought to make amends. On occasion, he would bring us small gifts and possibly every now and again take us out for dinner, little tokens of gratitude for putting up with him for so long. However, Daniel treated any information about his church like a closely guarded secret. When we um, pressed for details, he would casually deflect any of my questions, often changing the topic as quickly and as politely as possible. I learned almost nothing about his congregation and could barely ascertain the specific branch of faith he even followed. In passing, he would sometimes make references to stars or shepherds, which I assumed must have been a reference to the story of the Navity. Or another time, I overheard him on the phone talking to who I assumed was his pastor, referring to the King of Kings, another metaphor I attributed to Christianity. Still, my brother was a very, very private man after this, and I assumed, at first, that his reluctance to talk about his church stemmed from the desire not to impose his, pay his faith among us. A position that I, at the time, was very happy for. Then, almost six months to the day of his mother's death, he told us that he planned a rebaptization. Of course, my father and I approved. He wanted us to be present for the ceremony, which would be held the following Sunday, at a lake not far from our home. I found myself feeling anxious as the date approached, as I was not accustomed to the ritual uh, pleasantries of religion. The idea of dunking a man underwater to absolve him of his sins seemed like a quaint and ridiculous notion to me. But I wanted to appear to supportive, and after all, nothing would <laughs> help my stepbrother more and more than becoming a better man of a faith, which made him something worthwhile. The day came and my father and I arrived dressed in our best clothes, which given our finances wasn't exactly much to be speaking of. However, my dad was just so proud he actually managed to stay sober for the entire ceremony, which was a small miracle unto itself. There were fewer parishioners than I expected to be present, though. There were only about a dozen in all, not including the pastor, my brother. The pastor was an older man, I estimated somewhere in his late 40s, from his balding head. He was sporting a robe, and it was in all black, save for a small crimson emblem emblazed near the right breast of a chest. From a distance, it appeared to be a cross, wrapped in flames. He was pale and almost sickly looking, and wore the spectacles of what looked like their design from an earlier century. Yet, what stands out more in my mind now is above all else was a smile. A grin that stretched from ear to ear like you were imagining a shark would wear before feeding. Daniel approached us out of the crowd, looking at us pleased as I've ever seen him. He moved in for a hug, which I modestly returned. Oh my gosh, I'm just so happy you both could make it, he exclaimed, and making no attempt to hide a joy. This is just a big, huge day for me, and today is the day everything turns around. I, I swear it. He paused, and then the word, brother. The word took me back a bit. Uh, it, it, for a moment, I was just left speechless. In all the years I had known him, we have never been, well, willing to consider each other true siblings, and... This is the first time I've ever heard me call me as such. <laughs> um, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here uh, too, Dan. I stumbled over my words, still not ready to extend the same courtesy. Through, through in time, I thought, maybe one day, but not today. 
I'm uh, terribly sorry to interrupt, the pastor exclaimed from the lake's edge, but we do have appointments to keep, Daniel. Excuse me, father, my dad said, a little shocked as I was by the pastor's flat-out rudeness. Um, we just got here and I have a few words. Uh, no, dad, it's all right, Daniel said, cutting him off mid-sense. There are rules we have to follow. It's okay. We'll be done in just a minute. He turned from us to return to the group, and now I was noticing them for the first time. I saw that none of them were wearing clothes that would be considered appropriate for such a special occasion. In fact, all of them were wearing the same outfit, a bland, black and white wool garment that would have looked more at home in an Amish community. I began to wonder if my brother had joined some kind of cult, but followed them anyway, down by the river's edge. As my stepbrother began to wade into the lake, hand in hand with his passer, he paused for a moment and looked back towards me and my father, with a look that I only can describe as concern or perhaps even remorse. And then, he said three words that will haunt me to my grave. Don't be afraid. And before I could even ask him what that meant, he turned around and walked over to the water as he moved deeper. The crowd around us began without cue, starting to sing a weird, strange Hebrew song before I never heard, ominous but at the same time uplifting. The inflections with their tone was closer to a chant than a melody, though. It was around that time I realized that they were singing in some sort of like Hebrew or Latin that I knew something was terribly wrong. I dare not even attempt to transcribe what they were saying. Disregarding my stepbrother's warning, I felt an intense desire to flee or run into the water and rescue Daniel from what I was sure would be a horrible mistake. To escape into the woods and leave a surreal scene as many miles behind us as possible. But even as this instinct grew, I felt my feet rooted to the spot, my eyes transfixed on a ritual, unable to look away. While the pastor was now into the lake, past his waist, Daniel was slightly taller and crouched onto the water to stand with his head just below the man's shoulders. He looked up to the pastor, his face in Amish awe, as the man raised his hand above, his stepbrother, above my stepbrother's head, and he began to speak. We here today are here to cleanse our brother Daniel of his sins, he started to wash the spirit clean in this holy lake and present unto our Lord as a man of faith renewed his soul reborn in his absolute devotion to the absolute. He closed his eyes. Then, and with a look of utmost concentration, he uttered a chant in another tongue, one that I still haven't been able to place a region or a time in known history. Even without knowing their meaning, I could sense a power within those words, one that no other religion can claim authority over. It lasted over 30 seconds, but when he was finished speaking, I felt like I had been trapped and listing them for days. And then with swiftness, I wouldn't have expected this from a man of his advanced age. He lowered his hand to the scruff of my brother's neck, and then with his other arms merged my brother into the lake. In preparation of this day, I had watched over baptisms over the church so I would know what to expect, and I I knew my brother should have been under the surface for more than half a second, the whole time as if the pastor wasn't quite as quick as the younger ministers. When six seconds came by, Daniel was still being held under, my father began to yell. I honestly couldn't tell you what he screamed at the pastor, but the next minute of memory is still terribly muddied by what transpired. When I try to remember their small gaps, little details that I've forgotten, as if my mind is still trying to come to terms with what surely must have been impossible. What I do remember, though, is terrible enough, and I hope these are just simply abstractions that were merely created by my psyche trying to hope, trying to cope with the reality. But this is what I recall. As my father stormed off into the lake, the choir of strangers around us ceased their singing, and... Aside from what sounded like my father's ranting and splashing as it became unnaturally squat quiet, and the air became as still as a crypt. I remember then my father ceasing his advance and stopping mid-sentence when he became aware that, as I was, that there was something utterly dark and unholy transpiring before us. It was then when my pastor looked up from where he had held my brother, who had now been under the water for a full twenty seconds, and he slowly shifted his gaze onto me. He smiled, still vaguely, his still vaguely off-putting grin, 
had transformed into a twisted expression onto itself of simple unmistakable malice, his eyes were pitch black. Daniel, who was now, was surely drowning and began to thrash into water, his death throats and throbs kicking up waves disrupted the perfect silence that descended onto the lake. My brother was a strong man, young and healthy, yet this old priest was able to hold him under the surface as if he was a child. His grip was unrelenting, he was dying before me, and yet, to my horror, held me in place, unable to move, the struggle did not end, as far as I could tell, there was just so much as it was interrupted, originating from the spot where my brother was fighting for his life. I noticed a dark stain, spreading slowly across the surface, a jet black substance that seemed to have a consistency of ink or oil, branching into a tendril life form that seemingly moved from the purpose of defiling the water as if it crept closer and closer to shore. Here is an empty spot in my memory, a moment I am sure I do I am sure I truly do not wish to remember, where it remains where it resumes my father's gone. The next moment I can recall, I'm standing alone on the shore. The parish has disappeared, presumably taken by whatever my father was taken by. Or perhaps just dispersed into the forest, having found a ritual satisfactory. In the water, the pastor still stands, holding down my brother, whose last des desperate struggles were dying down into a few futile frash, barely able to cause a ripple over the surface. Then, the last few bubbles of escaping air I knew was gone. This fucking pastor was still staring at me. His eyes were the same shade as the stain that consumed the lake. His gaze never leaving mine. His smile never faltering. He wore a look of a grin of satisfaction, a knowing that godless act had come to a completion. And his eyes never leaving mine. He began slowly to descend into the depths, to the ground beneath that had opened up and swallowed him. Accepting him into the dark, it was only then, alone by the lake, I found I could move again. I, I promptly fell to my knees and I wept. The police never found my brother, my father, or any proof that of these, this fucking church's existence. They even had the audacity to accuse me of their f murder? But, I was released on lack of evidence. After all, there wouldn't be much of a case if they couldn't find the bodies to pin me onto. Begrudgingly, they sent me to the care of the psychiatric hospital, where the staff there has treated me well. I, I, I hold bitter resentment towards them. No one believes my story. They, they call it a, a fevered delusion of a dis, disharmonious mind. They try to put down my memory in pills and hunt uh, the hunt down for their meeting their hidden meetings, but they'll find none. I, I, I'm certain of it. It's terrible. It's impossible to be. But what I saw, I know what I witnessed. It's beyond anyone's grasp of ins the insane mind. I know this to be true. And when I lie at bed at night, unable to sleep, I comfort myself by thinking my brother knew what he was volunteering for. I tell myself his faith revealed to him that there exists a god other than man, than religion, or perhaps older than time itself. Gods that lie just beyond our understanding, waiting for their chance to reign again. He knew that they were coming, and he chose to willingly give himself up to them, to usher the return to our world. And I hear as if he were standing beside me, his final message. <laughs> Don't be afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm scared. <laughs>